we've kind of been up in, like, we got into just kind of a rhythm in the story of Exodus where we saw, um, where, where it was like we were dealing with actually the enemies of Israel, the enemies of the people of God. And so you had like these um, internal enemies through grumbling and complaining and being unfaithful, just um, being faithless, not trusting in the Lord. And we talked about like what it means to be the people of God. But that's really what this kind of this portion, this third act in the book of Exodus really helps us as, as New Testament Christians, really helps us to see like what does it mean to be the people of God? And, and kind of the big E on the I chart is we, as the people of God, we are those who trust the Lord, that God, by his grace, he has revealed himself. And we just sang two songs that deal with God's revelation, that God hasn't, by his, you know, again, by his mercy, by his grace, he hasn't left us up to our own. I mean, just think about that for a second. Like God hasn't just, he hasn't just said, here you go figure this thing out, I'll see you on judgment day where I'm going to damn you to hell, right? But yet he has, by his grace, even though we, as our rebellious people, even though we haven't followed him, God has, through mankind, I mean, for mankind, God has revealed himself. And we, as the people of God, that we see and understand a, a special revelation even, we see and understand the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. And so what does it mean to be the people of God? We are those that God reveals himself to, and we are those who respond in faith to God's revelation. We, we see God. We believe God. Uh, the song, How Great Is Our God, we are the ones that sing that. Why? Because God has revealed his greatness to us, and we get to sing songs like that knowing that he really is great. You know, he really is, we can magnify him in that. And so the people of Israel, like they, they miss that. They, they don't respond to God, even though God is revealing himself, even though he's revealed himself powerfully in powerful ways through the plagues, through the, the, the parting of the Red Sea, through the crushing of all of their enemies, through this, uh, this cloud and this pillar of fire. God has revealed himself to the people, and yet the people don't respond in faith. They respond in grumbling and complaining and murmuring and worrying and saying, oh God, you should have just left us back into Egypt, which highlights for us a very important truth that many of us can struggle with and that many times we can think that our faithlessness is due to God's lack of working miracles. Like, have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like if I could just see a bona fide miracle, right? Then I, I'd believe more then my, my, you know, I'd have no, there would be no doubt in my, in my heart and in my life. But what the people of Israel highlight for us is the problem isn't due to a lack of miracles. The problem is in our hearts. The problem is, is because we are rebellious people that left to our own, our hearts will go towards unfaithfulness and a lack of trust in the Lord. And, and so what does it mean to be the people of God? We're those who are trusting in the Lord. We trust in him in the big things and in the small things. Our trust is in the Lord. And then last week what we saw was we saw not just internal enemies, but we saw these external enemies of these Amalekites that come and they attack the people of God. And once again, we see God as the great rescuer. We see God as the redeemer, as God is the one who, who fights on behalf of his people as they fight. It's God who is empowering their fight. And now what we have this week, None of that that I just said for the last four minutes has anything to do with this sermon. This is recapping. But what we have for this week, it's kind of a parenthesis. It's almost like that storyline has been put on pause. And then there's two new or one, actually one new incident. And so 18 kind of stands out on its own. It's like, what the heck's happening here? I mean, it's, it's clear. Like as we read this together, you'll see that like, you, you know, honestly, you like, you won't need me this morning, right? Like, you, you won't like, oh, explain this to me. I mean, it's pretty straightforward as to what's happening, but it just happens in an odd place in the text. And so it's kind of, like I said, a parenthesis. Okay, and now this is what's happening. So um, Exodus 18, hopefully you've, you've, found that, uh, you've found that by now. What, I, what I'm going to do is just, um, let's just, let's just, let's just read it. So we're going to read it all, 27 verses. Are you, are you there? 
I have um, pickles. Like, you just never know. You never know what's going to be in here. I think these are from Haiti. I think this is actually not pickles. This is picklees. That's what this is. Is this true? Someone's brought me a gift and left it here. So this is Haitian coleslaw. Thank you, whoever that's from. But it's kind of... You just never know, man. I love it. All right. All right, you all ready? Here we go. Starting the, starting the verse 1, 18, verse 1. The Word of God says this, Jethro, the, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, Along with her two sons, the name of one was Gershom, Gershom, for he for he said, "I have, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land." And the name of the other, Eleazar, for he said, "The God, the God of my father, was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh." Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and your two sons with her, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him, and they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel and that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh He and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. The next day Moses sat to judge the people and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' when Moses's father-in-law Saul saw that he was doing for the people. He said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. You and the, and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what, and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe and, and, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, and but any small matter they shall decide for themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure, and all this people will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and tens. And they judged the people at all times. 
any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that in your grace you loved us enough to, to speak, to give us the wor- your word. In grace you loved us enough to preserve your word, that we can hold your perfect authoritative word in our lives. And so may we, just, may we just humbly submit ourselves under your word, under the instruction of your word. As you teach us what it means to be your people, just instruct us. May we be those who repent and turn from our idols and turn to you. May we be those who, even this morning, we behold your greatness. It becomes more than just a song, but it, became, but it is, for this day, it is the, the disposition of our hearts. That you are great. We love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. So what we see in this, in this text is we, what we can do is just kind of break it in half. We have um, the first 12 verses that, that is dealing with, uh, with Jethro's conversion. That's what we're seeing in this text is uh, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro. We see him be, being converted. And so what we see here in this text is we see the outworking of God's people. And then the second part of the text, from verses 13 to 27, we see um, Jethro giving advice to Moses. And so what we see then is the working on God's people. So we see the outworking of God's people, and then we see kind of the inworking and the working on um, God's people. In the first part of the text, the first seven verses, what we have is, a, is Moses' family reunion. I mean, it's summertime, right? Everybody loves a good family reunion in the summertime, and so that's what we have here for Moses, is Moses is having a family reunion, that we have Jethro coming down, and so who is Jethro? Maybe some of you are asking who haven't been tracking with us. This isn't, um, this isn't Jethro Bodine, you know, Clampett from the Beverly Hill, Hillbillies. Um, it's not Jethro Toll, for those of you that may know Jethro. Like, we don't need a, a guy that stands on one leg and plays the flute this morning. Um, this is a different Jethro. Um, this is Jethro, who is Moses' father-in-law. So we've been introduced to Jethro in Exodus, the second chapter, um, before he was Moses' father-in-law. What we saw was after Moses had killed an Egyptian and then had, had tried to bury him, tried to cover it up, and then this other Egyptian hears about it. Are you going to, are, are this, you know, this Hebrew, are, are you going to kill us like you did that other, like you did that Egyptian? And then what we saw was Moses flee. He, le- he left Egypt out of fear he traveled into the land of Midian, and there he helps Zipporah, who becomes his wife, and um, her, her sisters, and then he is introduced to Jethro, and so he marries Zipporah, and so now Jethro is his, um, is his father-in-law, and we see that Jethro brings with him Zipporah, Moses' wife, so even though the, the scripture is silent on this, what likely has occurred at some point during when everything's kind of breaking bad in Egypt, right? When the plagues are coming and all of those things that Moses has sent Zipporah and his two children out of Egypt and back into Midian, and they've been staying with, um, with Jethro. And now Jethro's coming down. He's heard of the exodus has occurred. He's heard that the Israelites and Moses are now safely crossed over into the Red Sea, and they're now into the, into the desert. And so he's bringing down the family. And so he sees, uh, Moses sees his father-in-law, his wife, his, his two children. And, and, and look at this with his children, that in this family reunion, it's a, it's a moment to remember God's faithfulness for Moses. I don't know why your parents named you what they named you. Possibly there's a story along that. You know, I, I asked my dad as a, as, a, as a child, like, Dad, why did you name me Andrew? And the answer I got for many years was just like simply, I like the name, um, I like the name Andy, your mom liked the name Andrew, so we went with Andrew, we're going to call you Andy, and that, and that was it. And then when I was um, 26 years old, one day my dad, out of the clear blue sky, he just says to me, he says, you want to know why we named you Andy? And I was thinking, no, that's when I was five, but you know, whatever. And I said, sure. And he said, well, I, I served in Vietnam with a guy, and his name was Anderson, and we called him Andy, and he was a heck of a good guy, I really liked him. So I'm, you're named after him, there you go. You know, and I'm like, okay, great. So I don't know why your parents named you. Maybe it was elusive like that. Maybe not. I don't know why they named you what they named you. But look, in um, especially in biblical times, names had meanings. And so the names of Moses' children have meanings. And look at the meanings of the name. One is, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. 
And so that's, that's Moses' story. But I, 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 I'm in Egypt, but Egypt isn't where I belong. I leave out of Egypt and I go into Midian, but yet Midian isn't where I belong. That where I belong is the, the place God's prepared for me, the promised land. That's where we belong. And second name of his second son is, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. I mean, as Moses sees his children, he's remembering, I think, in this, God's faithfulness that Moses has been an exile and a stranger, and yet God has delivered him and showered him with mercy, and he saved him and rescued him from the sword of Pharaoh, and now even he's ultimately caused him to triumph over Pharaoh. When Moses sees, we see in verse 7, when Moses sees Jethro, they greet each other. Don't be weirded out by this. He bows down and whatever else it says here, he, they bow down and he kissed him. Like, don't, don't get all freaked out. What this is just saying here is that it was a respectful greeting that they shared. Hey, I haven't seen you in a while. You're my father-in-law. I respect you. I love you. I, I, care, I care about you. And so they, they simply, they, they, they greet each other. And then after their greeting, they, they ask about their welfare. And then they, they, they kind of go into, they go into the tent. And so then as they're in the tent, then Moses begins to kind of unpack the story. Like, let me tell you, Jethro, all that God has done. And that's what we see in verse 8. You can see that in your Bibles if you still have them out. Or maybe you need to refresh your, your eye device. It says, And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake all the hardships that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. So look, this is, this is a summary of what Moses is telling Jethro. But notice that he's telling Jethro two important truths here. Truth number one that he's telling him, he's telling him of what the Lord has done. Like, let me tell you what God has done for me and for us, that God has rescued us. He's telling him, him here the good news of God's deliverance, the good news that we, that we serve a God who saves, who redeems, who delivers, who rescues his people. He's telling them, here's how exactly he did it. Let me tell you, like there were these plagues that came by and this final plague was the death angel, but yet God had told us to sacrifice a lamb and to sprinkle the blood over a doorpost and the death angel would pass over and the death angel did it and then it was time for us to get up and get out of there and the people asked the Egyptians for their gold and we took it and we, we got out of town and we, we left out and then after we were out for a day or so, then they came and they followed us and then the Lord spoke parted the Red Sea, and we crossed over on dry land, and on and on he's telling them of all of the great things that God has done for the people. But look, there's a second set of truths. The second set of truth, or the second truth that he tells them is also all the hardships that had come upon, the way, had come upon them along the way. So after we've left and then we've come, it hasn't just been like violins and, and roses and, and like uh, the yellow brick road. It hasn't been that, that there have been hardships along the way. We came in and there wasn't any water and the people were thirsty and all the water wells, it was bitter water. But guess what? God intervened and God made the water sweet and then we didn't have any food and then God rained down manna, bread for us, and then there were quail and then there were on and on the story goes, and then there wasn't any water again, and then God struck a rock. And so two things that he's telling him is, number one, he's saying that the Lord has, has what the Lord has done for us, but the second thing he's telling him is the cost of following the Lord. I think this is important for us. This is where it kind of gets applicable to our lives, that as we tell others of what the Lord has done, that we need to, to keep that in balance with also the cost of following the Lord. And in fact, Jesus says that if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That oftentimes we can paint pictures of what it means to be the people of God, and we, and we, could, and we could make God out to be kind of like the, uh, the infomercials that you see sometimes early in the mornings or in late, late night TV. You know what I'm talking about? So they, 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 you got this guy that comes on and it doesn't matter what 
the product may be that they're selling. It's the same storyline. That before you had the product, like life didn't make sense. Things couldn't work. You couldn't vacuum up the fuzz off the carpet, you know? And there's all this dust. You know, you know, you know like I, I hate what I'm saying and every, like when I'm talking or trying to talk. That's what I'm doing, trying to talk. And you all are like, what are you talking about? You, you with me? You know, you used to have this, ladies, you used to have this purse and you could never find anything in it, right? And you're just like, thank you all. There's some laughter, yeah. Maybe we get a laugh track in the background that would help me stay on task. Some laughter and an amen every now and then. And, and then you purchase this product and now like the vacuum vacuums itself, you know what I mean? It runs itself. The, the purse, that stuff pops out of it. Okay, that might be a little much, you know? Like, but you, you, you following me? And sometimes we can do that with, with our testimony, with our story. Sometimes we can reduce down like our testimony into very simplistic means to which we're just telling people like, you know what, my life used to be a total wreck. And then I prayed a prayer. Then I got saved. Then Jesus came into my life. And now everything makes sense. And, and certainly there are truths to that. Certainly Christ you know, makes our lives feel whole. Certainly that part of the problem we felt before is there was was no peace, there was no unity between us and the Lord. And now through Christ, we have peace with the Father and we come to know him. And there's a lot of the, the blanks in our lives are now filled in, but also there's hardships along the way. Luke writes in Acts, I think it's Paul that says this, that that it's through many hardships, through many tribulations that you'll enter into the kingdom of God. But that's, that's kind of the way that it works. And so Moses brings balance into that. I remember when I was a, when I was a, a, a new believer and we used to, at, at the church that I, I, that I attended um, for, for 10 years, I think, or, or more, and occasionally the pastor would have like open, not, open mic night, okay? So it'd be like a night where literally he would set a microphone up and then whoever in the congregation wanted to talk could come up and they could just share their story and they should just, um, and, they, and they could talk. Now, I know some of you in here are going to think, like, man, that's a great idea. We ought to do that. And it is a great idea until some joker gets up there and says a bunch of dumb stuff. <laughs> do you remember, the, um, you remember the Ray Stevens? Like, there was a Ray Stevens song about the squirrel that gets loose in the church, Right? And then it says, like, then, then, like, one of the saints, one of the sisters gets up and she begins to, like, because the squirrel's on her, you know, and she begins to testify, and it's like she starts, she got, starts naming sin, and then she starts naming names. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, open mic night's a great night until somebody starts naming names, you know? <laughs> and it goes back, it goes ba- like, been there. It goes bad after that, real bad. And so, uh, n- but what would occur on open mic night oftentimes would be people that, you know, would t- tell their story about how, Man, I, I, I was, you know, hooked on drugs. I was hooked on alcohol. I was this, I was this, I was this, I was this. And then I started coming to church, very simplistic terms. I started coming to church. Then I got saved, whatever it was. And then now I don't do any of those things. It's like, really, you don't struggle with sin anymore? And, and we, we got to fight the tendency to want to kind of color things up and put a veneer of religion over them. That yes, Jesus brings, he, he brings the dead to life. Absolutely. He radically changes our lives. That when we see and understand Christ for who he is, it, it demands a radical reorientation of our lives around, around him. But the hardships don't cease. The tribulations don't cease. But there is like what you see here with Moses. There's now purpose in those. He says, yes, we've had hardships along the way. As we've traveled through, we've experienced hardships. But notice what Moses says, but the Lord has delivered us. The Lord has delivered me and all those things. And so Moses sees that, he sees his journey for what it is. It's a journey. He says, yeah, there's been hardships along the way. There's been this along the way. There's been this all along the way. But God God has used them and God has delivered them that Moses isn't bitter because of his path. He's just honest about his path. Just honest about what they've seen. And this this text here, what we see, um, the the broader picture of it, it's it's so it's important for us. Like like I said, it's like it's Paul's in the storyline, but yet this parenthesis is important for 
for us as believers, I, I think in, in, a, in a number of ways, um, let me highlight two for you. It's number one is we see the heart of the Lord in this. We see the intention of the Lord. That the, the Lord, the Lord blesses and He delivers His people. But He, He wants us to be a blessing to the nations. Like the storyline just doesn't stop with us, but it includes others that God has rescued and delivered the Israelites out. And we saw this earlier because as the Israelites leave, we saw some Egyptians go with them. And now what we have is we have Jethro, a priest who is a a Midianite, coming to believe and trust in, 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 in Yahweh, in God. And this reveals God's heart, that God's heart is for the nations that when God speaks to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm, I'm cutting a covenant with you. I'm making a covenant that you will be blessed. And look, you will also be a blessing to the world, to the inhabitants of the world, to the, all the nations. That for us as a church, that we are those who, who, who carry with us a commandment from our Lord Jesus. And the commandment says, therefore, go make disciples of, of, what? of all peoples, of all nations. That God has a heart for the nations, for those that are far from him, that as we even as as we even sang Destiny Let Us in the song of the Revelation song that is about an event that takes place in the book of Revelation. And what John says in the book of Revelation is there are those singing a, a song similar to um, to that before Jesus, and it are it is those who who from every tribe, from every nation, from every tongue that Christ has redeemed. And we, we have to be careful, church, that we don't just see ourselves in, in, in a very um, myopic sense of being very close here, that we, we forget about what God is doing all over this globe. That God is, and, and also what he's doing in us as a church and in you as a, as a member of his church, that yes, you are his, his people, but one of the purposes of being his people is to worship him and also to be, to be light in darkness. That we are, you and I are the, the city set on a hill. That we are the ones to be uh, a shining a light. That the, the people of God are those that talk of the goodness of God. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty much that simple. That's what you see Moses doing. Hey, Jethro, let me tell you how good God has been to us. Even when things got tough after he delivered us out of Egypt, things got tough. But even in that toughness, God continued to deliver. He continued to show himself as being strong and being gracious and, and, and being mighty. That the people of God, of God are those that are continuously talking about the goodness of God. So let me, let me just ask you, when's the last time you told someone of the goodness of God? And certainly the goodness of God to us has been revealed in the person and work of Christ. When's the last time you have done like Moses, you've simply, you've humbly, with gentleness and respect, you've explained to someone else what God has done for you in your heart, in your soul, in your life, through the person and work of Christ, when Christ became your Savior, your Redeemer, your Deliverer. In verse 9, we see Jethro's response to what Moses says. It says that Jethro just, Jethro rejoiced, and Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel and that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And so he says he rejoiced. So this response, though, is is the, the word... It's difficult to translate. It's deeper than just showing joy. Like we would say rejoice. He rejoiced like, woohoo, that's awesome. But it's, it's, it's deeper than just, woohoo, this is awesome. Um, what it says is it's not just joy, but it's also with fear and trembling. It's joy with fear and trembling. To literally translate the word, it says he, he felt cuts on his body. And it's, it's very different than just, he, he rejoiced, but it says Jethro he, he felt cuts on his body. He, he has deep conviction. 
Certainly, I think what is going on in, in, in Jethro's mind is, if this is true, if God has revealed himself like this, if God has done this like this, then certainly these truths, this work, this God has implications on my own life. See, that's, for me, that's very close to my own story. Because like as a, as a, as, as a 15-year-old boy, like I kind of heard about Jesus, knew about Jesus. Again, my grandfather was a Baptist pastor. I know what you heathens thought I said last week, a bunch of sinners. My grandfather was a Baptist, not going to say it again, pastor. So I grew up on high holy days going to church. And, and that's what I, you know. And so it wasn't that I was totally ignorant of, of God, but it was that things that he would say, things that I had heard, stories that I'd read in the Bible, I, I began to connect the dots. And these are the same dots that kind of Jethro's connecting. It was the dots of, if this is true, if God is the creator, then certainly me as his creation, he has rights over me, he has authority over me. That if God loved me so much that he sent his son to die on a cross, cross, then Christ must have purchased me. It was very simplistic understanding of, of God and the gospel, but yet I understood if this is true, then there must be huge implications on this. That, 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 like for me at 15, it was this simple. Either, either God is real and I owe him my entire life and all of my being and everything that I do, or God is not real. It, it, it either has to be one or the other. That's same thing. And whenever I, when, I, when that penny dropped, when that penny dropped, is that right? When that light came on, the implications rolled. It was the same thing that Jethro felt. It was this deep sense of both joy and conviction. Joy that God is so gracious. Joy that God is so good. Joy that I can know him. And yet huge convictions because I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that I hadn't pleased God. I knew that I had rebelled against God. And so that's sort of the same thing I think that Jethro feels here. He feels conviction mingled with joy. It's what the, when, when Peter in Acts 2, when he preaches, it says that um, as Peter preaches the gospel to those Jewish hearers, it says this, that after they heard it, they were cut to the heart. That's what happens to Jethro here. He gets cut to the heart. Like cut through all the junk that's in our hearts that kind of, and all the questions that we're asking, it gets right down to business. Like if God is real, if Jesus is real, then that demands a response by me. And so Jethro's like, man, if God's worked in this, this must demand some sort of response. And so like in Acts 2, where they say they were cut to the heart and then they respond, what must we do, Peter, to be saved? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. Very similar thing here we see, Jethro doing. Jethro said, then blessed be, verse 10, blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the hand of Pharaoh, and delivered the people from under the hand of the Lord. Now I know. It is personal. This, he has his personal faith. Now I know that the Lord, now sometimes you and I, we use the word the Lord in a very generic sense. You know, it's, it's equivalent. Sometimes we would see the Lord as equivalent to like the man upstairs. You know, we would use those interchangeably, but that's not what Jethro is doing here. It's the capital L-O-R-D, the, the proper name of God. Now I know that Yahweh, now I know that he is the one. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair, they dealt arrogantly with the people because he's, he's taking care of his people. He's dealt with these people that have, that have stood in his in, in in their paths, he's dealt with them. And so what we see is Jethro coming to faith. Everything else I've worshiped is empty and I see immense value in God. I see how he's blessed his people, how he's worked and how he's worked through his people. And so there's multiple ways that this should work in us. Like first, I think we gotta ask the question is, have you done this? Like it's very similar to our own conversion stories, probably. You hear the gospel, that's what happens. He, he hears the good news of God's deliverance. He professes his own faith. He repents of following and worshiping idols. He comes to worshiping God. That's what, that's what we see in verses um, 
in verses 12, and then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and a sacrifice to God. And then he, and, and Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law and before God. And so he comes to worship God and to eat a celebration meal together with the people of God. So multiple ways this should work in us is one is, have you done this? Have you been born again? Have you passed from death unto life? Are you a new creation? Are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I don't know about the other two, but yes, I'm a Christian. Well, what makes you a Christian? Certainly Christians are those who are following Christ, who are obeying Christ, who love Christ, who long to live for Christ. Has this occurred in your life? Have you done this? Have you bowed? Have you repented? Have you turned? Have you been born again? And if you haven't, great news for you. As the Apostle Paul says, today is the day of salvation. That today is the day by God's grace that you're not standing before him in judgment. But you have opportunity by his grace to repent and to turn from your sins. And in fact, in just a few minutes, pastors that will be in the back of the room. That's where we do it. But in the back of the room, that we love nothing more than to pray with you. And I... I don't know, okay, let us, help, let us help you tease that out. And maybe it's just already a no. I've rejected Christ. I don't know him. I've never been born again, and I need to be. First, it begs the questions, have you done this? Second, it reminds you of your own story for those of you that are Christians. It should move in your heart that, look, you've got a pagan priest becoming a believer in God. And what an awesome God we serve, right? Like God welcomes the prodigals like you and I. That Jesus is a friend of sinners like you and I. That Jesus brings the dead back to life like you and I. And this text gives us opportunity just to revel in the grace of God. That God, I am spurned your name. I ran from you. I ran into my sin. I lived as if I were God. I worshiped idols of popularity. I worshiped idols of hopes of getting women. I worshiped idols of money. I worshiped all of those things. And yet, by your grace, when I was just a little punk, You revealed yourself to me and you saved me. You drew yourself to me. And then all of the many times that I've tried to run from you, and yet by your grace, you've kept me. And isn't that good news? That he loves you. He calls you his own. He's keeping you. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And yet, he comes after us. Be good. Number three, I think it should also give us boldness in our prayers and in our sharing of the gospel to others. That if God can save Jethro, he can save your neighbor. He can save your kids. He can save your dad. Don't, don't give up. Don't lose hope. Pray to the God whose arms are not short in bringing salvation. Pray. Ask God. Be bold in your prayers and be bold. As we talked about that last week, be bold in your prayers. God, save my, my pagan neighbor. He turns to science and not to you. He says, I believe in science, not God, but yet I believe, I know that you can save him. Save him. And now how are you going to save him? Save him through us. Save him through our conversations and answering questions and asking questions and loving him and through the discussions that we get to have with this guy. Save him. May this text give us Holy Spirit boldness. Second half, the next day. Verse Verse 13, and then the next day, so that's day one of Jethro's visit. 
They've been in the tent. They've ate. They've done all this. Jethro's been converted. Now they're going to go to bed, and then they're going to get up on the next day. And guess what happens on the next day? Moses goes to work. That's what happens because that's what Moses does. He's a worker. So Moses has to go to work. So the next day, Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. And then look, when, when Moses' father-in-law saw, so like Moses goes to work and his father-in-law tags along with him because that's not awkward at all, right? Like, I don't know that because, you know, Luann's dad passed away when she was just a baby. So I didn't, I didn't grow up with the awkwardness after the honeymoon of having to look your father-in-law in the eye. But some of you guys did, right? I didn't have to, I, didn't have to, I was spared that. Praise God. I didn't have the awkwardness of father-in-law showing up at work. But Moses does. His father-in-law shows up at work. And this is what Moses' job is, is Moses is settling the disputes uh, for the people. I mean, can you imagine this? Like so those, of you, those of you who are blessed to be parents and parents of multiple children, and sometimes you try to go on a trip, maybe as simple as to Louisville, not even really to Louisville, but to Middletown, and you're on the way, and in the back seat the entire time you get, he took my iPod, right? She's looking at me. She touched me, right? They breathed on me. Ah, make him stop. Make her stop. Oh, you know, not that my kids would ever do anything, but I've heard. And like Moses, they're on a trip, and it's like Moses has got a bunch of school children in the minivan behind, with him. There's, I mean, can you imagine? There's like 600,000 of them, maybe as many as 2 million of them. And from time to time, they get tangled up. He took my camel. Oh, you know, she put her tent on my land. Oh, they took, right? Like that's what's happening here. And so they're all tangled up. And so part of Moses' job is he sets up shop, puts a little canopy over him, sits down and the people come in front of him and Moses judges the people. And so what he's simply doing is, He's just mediating their disputes. He comes in and he's, he's mediating them. He's everything. Moses is the judge, the jury, the legislation, the executive branch, Department of Motor Vehicles. He's all of it. And whenever, um, and whenever Jethro sees this, it's not bad enough to have your father-in-law like join with work to you. How bad is this? Your father-in-law watching you work and then replying with, what you're doing here isn't good, <laughs> Right? <laughs> So that's what he says. Jethro says, hey, what you're doing here isn't good because he's sitting all alone and he's doing all of this. And it's great advice that we see that Jethro gives. He says, look, and you and the people, you are certainly wear yourself out for the thing is too heavy for you, Moses. You are not able to do it alone. And this highlights a couple of problems. Certainly this highlights the problem of the weakness we see in Moses. Moses, you're just a man. You can't do it all. But I think even bigger than that, it highlights a, a greater problem, and the problem is in the people. It's not just that, okay, the people are getting oh, into, into, into problems, into disputes, but what Moses says in preceding what I just read to you in verse 15, and Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God, when they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another and I, make them, and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And so it's really revealing the, 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 the corruption of, of the heart of, of man here. It's the corruption of the Israelites here. That they don't, they don't know, they don't know God. They don't know the laws. They don't know what's right. They don't know what's wrong. They don't, they don't have any idea here because they've yet to be given. So there, there's something coming down the pike. They need, what do they need? They need a law. They need, they need something that that governs them, something that instructs them. But also the, there's there's the greater truth in here. And the truth is that people don't sin out of ignorance. They sin because hearts are corrupt. Because the law will come. We're getting ready to get into that. That's, that's, that's act number three. We kick off in a couple of weeks with 10 weeks in the Ten Commandments, and then we'll wrap it up with a couple more weeks of the law. And so the, the, it's, not that, oh, it's not just that the people are ignorant, but the problem is they don't know God and they have corrupt hearts. And so not, not only is this, this ask for, we needed the law, but it also highlights another weakness of ultimately we need the gospel. Because we just don't need an outward set of do this, don't do that. Because what's our response to do this, don't do that? 
Don't touch that. Gotta touch it. We bristle under the law, and ultimately we need our hearts changed. And so this highlights a few things. It highlights that. But then here's the, here's the solution that Jethro offers. One is, Moses, you got to know your role. You don't need to be doing all of this. But Moses, know what your role is. You're the mediator. You're the priest of the people. Your job is to represent the people before God and God before the people. That's your primary task here, Moses. And second, not only do you need to know your role, but second, you need some men. That's what you need, Moses. You need some men to stand up beside you, some men to help you out. Not just any men. Notice this. Stay with me just another minute or so. Not just any men. Verse 21, moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God who are trustworthy and hate a bribe and place men over the people as chiefs. So, so not, just, not just any men, but you need humble men. You need men of character, men that love God. That's what you need. You need men that understand that they will be judged. They, they fear God. You need trustworthy men, reliable men, dependable men, honest men, humble men, honorable men, upright men, principled men. That's what you need, Moses. Men who, who aren't going to take a bribe. Men who are, it's not just that they're wise. It's not just, oh, they got good people skills. Not that they're good at lawyering up. But it's men with character. See that? Character. Character, character, character. Look at the character of the men. And then when you find men like that, men of reputable character, men that fear the Lord ultimately and supremely, then here's what you need to do is place them over the people. So you have overseers over the people, thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens, and they will bear the burden with you. Now, this text is echoed again in, in, in the scriptures in the New Testament in Acts the sixth chapter. As we see the structure of the church being built up, what we see is kind of the same, the, the, it echoes this. A fine, a fine men, elders and deacons who will serve the people, men of, and then as Paul writes in, in 1 Timothy and in Titus, as, or yes, in 1 Timothy and Titus, as he writes about the men who are, to, who are to lead Christ's church, it's men of character. It's men of character. Look at the men of, of character. See, the problem is, is when one man tries to do it all, he can't. It's not healthy for, for him, nor is it healthy for the people. And that for us is why we have a church led by a plurality of elders. That we don't have a Moses in this church. We don't have the title of senior pastor for this church. The senior pastor of this church is Jesus. He's the senior pastor. He's the chief shepherd. Like I'm not, like in this text, I'm not Moses in this text. I'm one of the reputable honest, trustworthy men that the, that, that, that the priest, the high priest Jesus has, has, has given and has, has called and commissioned to, to lead hundreds, maybe, you know, it's about maybe, maybe tens, I don't know, but to, to, to lead the people. That what we see here is it's not healthy for one man that, like this church isn't built on one man, this church is built upon, upon Jesus. Like, and that plays out, the implication of that plays out for us. That, praise God for that. But there are so many churches that are built upon one man, one, one personality. And then when that man dies or quits or whatever happens to him, the church implodes. Like, if, if I'm on the elliptical tomorrow and the, the heart gives out, and I collapse of a heart attack because prior to the elliptical, I've eaten too many chicken wings and, and, and just the, the elliptical wasn't enough to bring balance into the force. You know what I'm saying? You gotta do a lot of uh, elliptical to offset the, the amount of Mountain Dew and chicken wings that, that I can take in, right? And so it's just uh, not too, and I collapse. If the plane goes down on the way to Haiti, if Pastor Frank fires me next week, right? Whatever it may be, Pastor Brian, like he preaches that next Sunday and he preaches for the next couple of Sundays to follow. He just keeps on preaching because it's not built upon one 
person. This text, it also reminds us of the importance of godly leaders in the church. The task of shepherding God's people is not something to be taken lightly. It also teaches us of God's care for his people. Like, why does, he, why does he take the time to put all of this and set this up? Because he wants you to know that you're cared for. Why does God commission and why does God send godly leaders? So that you may be cared for because he loves, he loves his people. This text, it, it, even though it's a parenthesis, it's just so rich. It really is. It's so, it's so rich as we see that the Lord is the one who saves. Like, who's the hero in this text? Like, Moses isn't the hero, and Jethro isn't the hero, even though we see oh, Jethro, Jethro, Jethro in this story. Like, the Lord is the hero in this. That the Lord has saved his people. The Lord has delivered his people. He's called them out of Egypt. He, he's, he's rid them of their taskmasters. The Lord has saved his people. And you and I, we, like Jethro, we can hear the good news of God's deliverance. We can profess personal faith in God. We can come to know him. We can repent of all our idols. We can come and we can worship God and we can come and we can join with the people of God in eating a celebration meal together. And in fact, that's what we have this morning as an opportunity for us to remember those very things is to remember how gracious God has been in our lives and how God has called us and saved us, delivered us, redeemed us through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That God loved and cared for his people. And God sent his son, his only son, to die on a cross for us, that through him we might be saved. That through him, through for anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so this morning we get to remember those of us that are the anyones who've called upon him sometime in our past, that we get to remember the Lord's salvation. And the way that we remember that, remember that is through this celebration meal. That here at the point we take the Lord's Supper every week. It is for those who are repentant followers of Christ, not those who are living perfect lives, but those of us who are renouncing our idols and longing to worship and to love God. That we don't have to offer a sacrifice to God, but we remember the sacrifice of Jesus offered for us through this. That this is bread, it's simple bread. It's been cut up into pieces, but it represents Christ's body that was broken for you. That this cup, it's just simple grape juice, but it represents so much more. It represents Christ's blood shed for you. And Jesus said, when you eat this, as you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. That this morning you have opportunity to remember the Lord Jesus. To remember how great is our God. To remember that you were as confused and as lost and as far away from God as a pagan priest. And yet God rescued you and God saved you. Now God has called you his own because of Jesus. And so the way that we remember the Lord's Supper, the way that we remember Christ is, or the way we practice the Lord's Supper and remember Christ is this. We simply take a piece of this bread, we dip it into this cup, and then we eat it. Either you can do it here, there's two stations here, two stations in the back. You can do it at either of the stations. You can take it back to your seat. You can stand um, back there as well. Like I said, there will be pastors that are in the back that would love nothing more than to pray with you. Offering baskets that are in the back, if you'd like to give to the church um, as a response to, what, um, to, to Christ and to who he is and how he commands us to live as, as good stewards of our money, offering baskets that are, are back there where you can give.